And the first person known to us by tradition as having established a navy is Minos. He made himself master of what is now called the Hellenic Sea and ruled over the Cyclades, into most of which he sent the first colonies, expelling the Carians and appointing his own sons governors, and thus did his best to put down piracy in those waters, a necessary step to secure revenues for his own use. Well, hello there. Welcome. Here we are again, deep into the history, despite the show being called Let's Talk About Myths, baby. I really can't do it without laughing. If you're just joining, seven years ago, I decided to sing into a microphone just the title of the song, Not Well, and now I can't stop. I am your host, Liv, here today with the history of the place that gave us some of the most interesting myths, Crete where the world of the Bronze Age Minoans was so magnificent, so culturally connected with Asia and Africa, that it became the place where the continents met, where Europe gained its name, where the Palace of Knossos was so monumental, so sprawling and full of winding staircases and storerooms, that it inspired the labyrinth where bulls were so sacred, so important, that they were painted onto walls and formed into so many pieces of art and items from daily use, that surely there was once a minotaur, a creature emblematic of the connection the Minoan people had with their bulls. Behind all these wonders of myth are very real people living their very real lives, only to have what remained long after they were gone inspire some of the most iconic and bizarre of Greek myths. Today, we are returning to the Bronze Age origins, covering the earliest of the two most important proto-Greek cultures, the Minoans of Crete. This is episode 256. There once was a man named Minos, the Bronze Age Minoans of Crete. There was probably not a real man named Minos. Just don't tell Thucydides, whose quote I read at the top of the episode. I talked about him on Tuesday, too, as this beautiful example of just how tangible Greece's mythical history was to the people of later periods who were writing their own forms of history. Still, there was probably not a real guy with that name. Or if there was, his wife almost certainly didn't have sex with a bull. And if she did, and that's an enormous if bull-sized, then she probably almost definitely, you know, didn't do it with the help of a bizarrely fascinating contraption made by a famed inventor. And if somehow in the course of human history shifting possibility that she did, I mean, if we go that far, who the hell knows, maybe there was a minotaur. But let's be real, none of that has any basis in historical reality, save for all the many wonderful things the Minoans left behind and then which managed to inspire such a bizarre myth of divine madness. Ingenious and disturbing contraptions and arguably one of the most iconic monsters of all time. Because there was absolutely a people of Bronze Age, Crete. And they do, at least now, take their name from the mythical Minos. They lived on Crete for many, many centuries. Many, many centuries, where they built the labyrinthine palace at Knossos and filled it with a hell of a lot of bull iconography and goddesses wielding snakes. One mustn't ever forget the snake-wielding goddesses. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Can you tell I'm caught up in the mythology? 
this is Michaela's history series. Let's be honest. Where do we even start? Well, I mentioned on Tuesday's episode, the period that we now call the Bronze Age spanned something like 2,000 years and a wide range of cultures across the Mediterranean. But for all I love the whole of the ancient Med, we are most concerned with Greece on this podcast, and thus, there are two main cultures that we talk about when it comes to the Bronze Age of Greece. Again, we will be looking at the other cultures who were doing such incredible things alongside and often before the Greeks. That's just for a future episode. Today is all about the Minoans, who were primarily on Crete, and next week, the Mycenaeans, primarily on the mainland. And for all they were seriously fucking cool for Greece and the course of its history, they were pretty minor compared to the people of the broader Mediterranean. But just because they weren't as big and impressive as the Egyptians or the Mesopotamians or the Hittites around this time, that doesn't mean they weren't <laughs> seriously cool. It just means I have to remind you that for all Greece gets the credit for so many things from the ancient world, the Egyptians in Egypt and the Mesopotamians in ancient Iraq and others, for that matter, did a hell of a lot of things before Greece. It doesn't lessen any of the things that Greece did, let alone that Greece did first. It just reminds us that for all the hype the Greeks get for starting so-called Western civilization, that tends to serve to lessen the impact of the darker-skinned people who did so much else so much earlier. As for the Greeks, though, well, at least compared to the Mycenaeans, the Minoans did a hell of a lot first. So let's get into the details, this nitty-gritty of what was going on in Crete during the Bronze Age. So habitation on Crete began pretty early on in the Neolithic period, which was followed in the early Minoan period by a migration of people from the east. From here, we really begin to see an identifiable culture appear and that we call Minoan. It's best not to think of this as a result of the migration of those peoples. Like, we've got to remember that the Mediterranean was always highly connected. And to say that the people living on the island originally were just, like, walking around not doing much else, like, would be a mistake. People moved in, but this migration was adding to the cultures that already existed and the groups that were already there and just creating something new. This is not an invasion in any sense of the word. Like the movement was happening during this period was like largely migratory or trade related. And we will see like big groups of people moving around later in the series. And I just I don't want you to jump straight to assuming invasion when you hear about people moving around later on. There has always been movement in the region. When we're talking about Crete, we're really talking about a huge number of islands, too, like right in the middle of the Aegean, in close proximity to what would become mainland Greece, Turkey, Cyprus, Egypt, Palestine, Lebanon. The list goes on. And when it comes to Crete, there's lots of ceramic evidence from inland sites that show us that the people living on Crete before the migration were kind of doing their own thing. Remember, too, when it, when it comes to this time period in Greece, what we tend to be working off of is a purely archaeological evidence. It isn't until much later that the writing system that we call Linear B, you know, the one that we can decipher today, made its way to Crete from the mainland and replaced their own writing systems, which to this day we cannot decipher and so are left not in the dark, but resorting to things beyond words. In these early days, we are working off entirely material culture, like the stuff people left behind and which survived. It's through these types of archaeological finds that we learn that coastal sites show evidence of contact with these outside cultures from the wider region. We know this because the finds in those coastal regions is often of like a higher value, you know, luxury materials. Essentially, it's evidence of trade in the wider Mediterranean, and often those pla those items can be linked to where they were coming from, too. Because, yes, like, I have and will always remain a broken record when I remind you that ancient Greece never existed in a vacuum, and the ancient Mediterranean was always highly connected. Like, everyone was everywhere, sharing their cultures, like, definitely having wars, don't get me wrong, but there was a lot of great sharing of cultures. And it's important to remember that Crete is a very big island. Like, I have heard Greeks joke that it's so big it's not even an island, like, it's basically mainland. This is relevant 
that I tell you that it's big, you know, because it is the biggest Greek island and that makes a big difference. But as someone who grew up on Vancouver Island, like I am obligated to point out that Crete can actually fit into my absurdly large island like over three times. Why must I point out that my island is so much bigger? I honestly don't know. Like in my head, there's a competition for what counts as like a big island while still being very much an island disconnected from the mainland. And I just think that like we win in that competition that only exists in my mind. The point is that because Crete is so big, particularly compared to the other Greek islands, save for Evia, which, you know, is so close to the mainland, it might as well be connected. So it's like, it's this really unique player in the realm of the ancient Mediterranean, because it is, I I imagine, the biggest island in the whole of the Mediterranean and very centrally located in that eastern end. Like, the sea is right there. It fosters these connections with the outside world. And specifically, Crete, you know, is in this really interesting location. Like I said, it's basically halfway between the Greek mainland and Egypt and then the rest of Africa and the Levant to the south and the southeast. It's just right in the middle, really, if you're looking at, you know, the mainlands of the region. It is so perfectly positioned to be in contact with everyone. this time and later, obviously, the Mediterranean was like a super highway for the people of the whole region. It was a highly connected world. And not only did the sea offer that connection to other people, you know, their cultures and whatever materials and products they had to share at that time, but it also had so many resources itself. Like the sea means life for ancient people in such a real and varied way. So these coastal regions of Crete just have it all. The sea, trade, access to this wider Mediterranean and all that it has to offer for the development of this new Minoan culture. And again, because Crete is so big, there are also inland settlements where there's land for agriculture and raising animals. Crete is really mountainous too. So its land was just, there was so much possibility there. And while these coastal and inland settlements operated at the same time and collaboratively with one another, there is also this clear distinction between the two and what they could offer to the people living in each of them. The inland sites focused primarily on agricultural production, you know, that would go on to support the larger area. And then the coastal sites seemed to remain this point of contact for trade and interacting with the outside cities and then obviously fishing and the like, everything that's coming from the sea. And so throughout Minoan history, these two spheres of habitation and production continue pretty reliably. They're always working off one of each other and collaborating to make this whole thing work. And how this ties in with migration is important. These sites of contact with the outside world, the coastal areas and where we see more influence and movement from the outside world. But this contact and the resulting changes aren't fundamentally creating something new or changing the way the Minoan world worked. Like, yeah, you know, new ideas and technologies are coming through these ways. That's just a result of contact with other cultures that have been, well, you know, like culturing for a lot longer than the Minoans. But what's happening is also this movement of outside people coming in and not necessarily some kind of cultural takeover. Like, I think it's hard for us to totally understand because we come from this world of imperialism and colonialism. But this isn't a case of colonizing. It's more about collaboration around the region. Not to say there weren't wars, but it just wasn't yet about creating some broad empire by colonizing and subjugating others and forcing new cultures upon them. The Mediterranean has always been a kind of shared space where multiple groups lived alongside each other and didn't feel the need to enforce their culture or religion on others or force out or get rid of 
those others. It's not like the world so often wants to do now. Over the last few centuries specifically. Decades even. Right now. But especially at this time, we are talking more about collaboration in terms of cultures. You might think of this for, you know, a certain stretch of land to the south where from the ancient period onward, multiple groups lived together at once. And it, it, was, it was fine. It's relevant is all. And a good example of this comes from an episode that I did sometime last year about, you know, the Eastern origins of Aphrodite and Adonis. These are cultural characters who are very Greek, but we know that they were heavily influenced by the people of the region. It's more like they're working together to create their cultures rather than overtaking and forcing something new on a people. To an extent, obviously, like I'm generalizing a bit, it wasn't some perfect peaceful paradise where no one ever fought, but it just wasn't like anything like what would come later. This is a point that just ends up getting a little lost in our modern world where cultural exchange can be really difficult to navigate. But like, because this isn't about overtaking and forcing something new on people who would then lose their pre-existing culture or have it like snuffed out of them. Appropriation is not happening because the people who are living and interacting with each other are not taking other cultural practices and turning them into something that they are not. There's no bastardization of culture happening here. What it is, is this sort of cultural like bilingualism where ideas are shared and understood within the context of a given area and maybe create something new collaboratively. Think Rome and their religion, where they aren't just like stealing the Greek gods and changing their names, like sometimes people want to say, including myself ages ago, but they are understanding the gods of the Greeks or the Celts or any other individual that they came across within their own cultural framework and melding and forming them into something entirely new and entirely Roman, but which still holds the cultural memory of where it came from. This is not uncommon in antiquity, and especially in belief systems that are just inherently polytheistic, because there is space for more gods. This sharing of ideas, not just in belief systems, but also in administrative or daily life, is like really common when groups of people come together. Sometimes someone else's system just happens to be more helpful. It's, it's modern monotheism that makes this idea murky, that, that meant it was more of a competition about whose god was right or wrong, rather than just, like, adding them into a pantheon. And eventually, for the Minoans, this, this cultural exchange happens with the Mycenaeans on the mainland, and we start to see a lot of things shared between these two groups, who will go on to become what we know as ancient Greece. You'll hear about it more in my conversation episode next week on the ancient Mycenaeans, but the contact between these two, at least, changed a lot of bureaucratic and administrative things for the Minoans, like recording records in Linear B, the language that was brought over by the Mycenaeans. Whereas alternatively, the Mycenaeans end up with a lot of art and things from the Minoans. It was very reciprocal, just ancient peoples trading and sharing amongst themselves, the Mycenaeans conversation I'll have goes into a lot of fascinating details about this, including a moment where I learn why the Golden Fleece existed as a myth and why it was located in Colchis. You all know how much I love to learn a little bit of mythological, is it etiology? You know, the origins. The why. It's so weird. But I digress. Basically, it's not a fucking dumpster fire like what the Western world did to create the Americas. And it's it's not what's been happening in, since 1948 by a certain place that shall remain nameless. Instead of the destructive nature of modern imperialism, you know, that seeks to snuff out the pre-existing cultures by enforcing a new culture or simply killing everyone horribly if they threaten the empire... But instead, it's people around the Mediterranean making their way to Crete and contributing to the socioeconomic changes that are happening and building something new and, again, collaborative. I'm going to keep harping on on how this differs from our modern world because not only is I think it important and also somewhat difficult to wrap our heads around because, at least in the West, we exist within this framework of imperialism being the way things are done. But also because I think it's really interesting proof 
of the flaws and horrors of in- imperialism and how before it became about enforcing other cultures on somebody else, it was a lo- about collaborating within existing cultures, sharing, and, and just a generally more pleasant experience for everyone. And as we will see towards the collapse, there is also a lot that happens to quote unquote collapse these civilizations that is incredibly reminiscent of things we are dealing with now. And they figured out how to get through it. We might take a page. Ultimately, this is how the Minoan history begins, with little island towns that connect the wider Mediterranean, and they start slowly making a name for themselves. People are moving in, because honestly, who doesn't want to live on an island? (laughs) I'm keeping that in, but Michaela wrote it because personally, I'm not a huge fan of living on my island. I would much rather create, but here we are. And these people are moving in to Crete, these Bronze Age people, 4,000 years ago. And they are helping to stimulate life there, add to the existing cultures, and create something new and beautiful. So what comes next for the Minoans? We know they're building their culture and hanging out with everyone else in the wider med. I have made that very clear. But what about the Minoans themselves? Well, toward the beginning of the Middle Minoan period, we start seeing a clear sign towards the emergence of the palatial system that will become basically the defining factor in both Minoan and Mycenaean history. The term palace is a bit of a holdover from their early discovery. Really, they are like these large complexes of the ruling elite and came to represent the cultures and how each one operated administratively. Like, we will get there, but just know I'm going to use the word palace and palatial. It's not what we think of. It is just these enormous complexes that kind of held and housed the culture broadly within them. And of course, these palatial centers didn't just pop up overnight. There's indication that there was a gradual development over time to the centers that we know today. And they seem to have gone on to later inspire similar complexes on the mainland by by the Mycenaeans. Like in Crete, they were present on the island before the start of the Middle Minoan period, generally spanning from around 2200 to 1900 BCE. So long ago, just not quite in their final form yet. But the Middle Minoan period is generally defined by the emergence of these kind of finalized, in whatever way, palatial centers as major aspects of Minoan society. And with them comes this greater understanding of what society was. The palatial complexes of the Minoans and later the Mycenaeans have just captured the imagination throughout time. When Arthur Evans was excavating at Knossos, How the palace there was laid out brought to mind this idea of the labyrinth, just like it did to the ancient Greeks. To him, the center at Knossos was where the the official labyrinth that housed the Minotaur stood, and thus, this was also where Minos ruled. He was really hooked on the myths, and so he named the people, the Minoans, after this mythical king, and we continue to call them that today. Obviously, this name is a modern one and not necessarily what the people living there at the time understood themselves as, but we can see from the later periods of ancient Greece that they believed something similar via their own mythical history. It's just that Evans was the one to make it official and also to turn Knossos into like a bit of a theme park rather than an archaeological site. Like early rich white men archaeologists (laughs) did some damage. What can I say? We aren't sure what the Minoans of the Bronze Age referred to themselves as, but we do get indications from other sites around the Mediterranean of, like, what other people called them. On the Aegean lists found at Amenhotep's Third's Mortuary Temple in Egypt, we get the name Keftiu. It was at the top of this list of Minoan sites, which included Knossos, so it may have been what they were called kind of collectively. And then the Mesopotamians in ancient Iraq and the Canaanites and the Phoenicians in the Levant seemed to call them Kaftor. We can't say what they called themselves, but it's interesting to imagine what others called them. You know, these names and how we see them forming later Greek words. It comes up in my final conversation for this series. It's so fascinating to hear how 
they came to form later words that we know so well. We're going to talk about when it comes to Troy. Oh, it's good. But back to the palatial complexes. The the complexes and how they were organized tells us so much about how the Minoans functioned. Starting off small, they eventually grew into the large palatial centers that we see the remains of today. In order to build these centers as big as they were, a culture needs to the resources to plan it all out, to employ the craftsmen who will do the work, the materials, the labor, as well as an emerging social structure based on rank that would necessitate such a palace, let alone be capable of creating it. And so this emerging elite is important. It represents an expansion that was not seen before this point and will become very important in the collapse. Class division influences so many things in a group of people, from culture, administration, basic social structures of the cities. And as these cities grew and the palaces with them, they were interacting with the other cities of the region and expanding. But what we learn about Knossos and other Cretan sites is that there doesn't appear to be like this a central figure in the elite class. Like there was no Minoan king. No Minos, if it were, and no Wanax figure, as we see later on the mainland. Burials were less rich, which suggested less competition amongst the elites to like really solidify these claims. The elite class here likely were more widespread in terms of power. It was just less concentrated on one person or family ruling over these cities and surrounding areas, not like what we might imagine. The central courtyard is a major aspect of these palatial centers, like the most important. Large courtyards help to shape the building around them, and they seem to have been used for public gatherings, like festivals or other religious celebrations. Based on surviving frescoes, frescoes, we understand that there was a religious element, you know, to these palatial complexes. And we're going to get back to the frescoes, I promise. But The orientation of the courtyard emphasizes this along with the frescoes because the courtyards tended to be oriented towards mountains where sacred peaks or cave sanctuaries have also been found. They loved a good cave sanctuary on Crete. I took a Bronze Age Aegean archaeology class in, I don't know, 2011 and that is like one of the main things that I remember alongside uh, the goddess figurines I have regaled you all with far too many times. But what of these sacred peaks and cave sanctuaries? What uh, what are they? You may ask. And if you didn't, then you should because who doesn't love a cave? The main focus of Minoan religion aside from a large tradition around funerary rituals, very common at the time, appears to be fertility and the seasonal cycle. You know, just as one would expect from a community that relies so heavily on the land to sustain itself. Which is when I remind you about the large, and I mean large, volume of goddess figurines that have been found on Crete and the wider Aegean. I know I just said it, but still, we don't necessarily like know what they were used for, but the volume of them that have been found is enormous. There are lots of reasons to believe in a central goddess worship type situation here. But infinite mother goddess questions aside, since I covered them only last month, we return to the peaks and the cave sanctuaries. These are super important sites for Minoan religious worship on the island, plus they are cool caves, but it was important for these sites to be visible to the surrounding areas, and that's why this central courtyard of palatial structures was oriented in such specific directions. (sighs) And lots of votive offerings have been found in these sites, like clay figurines in the form of animals, humans and human body parts, such as legs and eyes and so on. Fancier things too, like jewelry, seals, and the iconic Minoan double axes called the labrys hmm, that Crete is known for. We'll get back to that. The main area of ritual practice within these sanctuaries tended to be flat rocks and concentrations of stones, particularly white ones, to mark the sacred area. The most sacred areas in cave sanctuaries were also marked by the stalagmites that naturally formed in the cave, where there are instances of the double axes being carved into them. It's just so cool. The importance of the caves made its way like 
deep into the mythology too. Just think of Zeus when he was spirited away right after he was born, hidden from his father's ravenous eyes on Mount Ida in Crete. Like I talked about last week, this is another example of mythology forming around what evidence is left behind by earlier people. Plus, just caves, folks. Like, they are fun for worship. I have visited only one cave in Greece. Now it's on my list. It was on Paros. But holy gods, is it absolutely incredible. I also, and I'm just going to share this anecdote without looking it up because this is just a singular memory I have from my Bronze Age archaeology course in the year 2011. And that is that in one of these cave sanctuaries, there was like a hole dug in for some kind of ritual purpose. And within it, there was, I don't know if it was water or what, scientifically this seems wrong, but it's just what's in my memory. Don't quote me on it. But there was like something in the bottom. And when they lifted out like whatever the finds were for their archaeological needs, there was like an olive that had been somehow still totally preserved because of whatever was in there for like thousands of years. I don't know. I need to learn more about this ancient olive. For now, I'm just sharing that information. For now, I am just sharing that information. down off the mountains of Crete and back to Knossos, let's talk about those frescoes, the wall paintings, and what they say about the practices of the Minoans and generally just how beautiful they are. I want you to Google them. I want you to Google the wall paintings from both Crete and Akrotiri. I don't have time to get too deep into Akrotiri today or even mention it at all. We will get back to Akrotiri, but for now I want you to Google both of them. And this is where I tell you that it is time for bull leaping. Or rather, where I just tell you that there is one stunning fresco of a man leaping over a bull. They absolutely loved a bull, which is, of course, how they became eventually associated with the Minotaur. But there is a whole episode's worth of curiosity as to how exactly that came together. I want to assume that there was no bestiality involved, but I suppose we can't be entirely certain either way. The frescoes, though. The frescoes. They are life-changingly beautiful and give us this really unique insight into the Minoans. There's another fresco called the Grandstand Fresco, where women are gathered in one of the palatial center courtyards. These figures could be understood as like an epiphany of the goddess or maybe even a high priestess presiding over the activity. Women feature so heavily in these scenes and combined with the heavy use of goddess figurines, it's just one of many indicators that goddesses were particularly important, especially compared to to the later periods. This is pretty true of the Mycenaeans too, though they did it differently, but it will come up heavily in my conversation about them, so stay tuned. Basically though, it just suggests that there was major goddess worship to a very different degree from later and possibly as the central figures of religious worship. There were male gods, certainly, but the emphasis visually from what we have was very much on the women. Plus, again, if you will see when you Google the women in a lot of the the frescoes painting, they're like dancing and they wear these big long skirts and they have these very cool tops that just have their boobs out. And I think it's wonderful. (sighs) All of it, just the good old days. These kinds of visual evidence, though, have little suggestions of iconography that will go on to be so important in the grand scheme of Crete, like the double-edged axes, the labrys, bulls, and the famous horns of consecration. And that's right, yeah, labrys, as in the etymological root of labyrinth, because Crete. And again, we are looking at the origins for these myths, like not a real minotaur in a labyrinth, but what evidence was left behind by earlier cultures and which was then seen and interpreted by the people who came later. Between the volume of bull iconography, the bull jumping, the heavy goddess worship, and the twisty-turny nature of the palace of Knossos, it is really easy to see where these later mythological, 
mythic history kind of notions came from. And the Europa of it all, too, the myth that says that Zeus brought Europa, this Phoenician princess, from the Levant to Crete and thus created Europe, it says so much about how they later acknowledged the way that these cultures were so deeply interconnected and shared so much to create what became the wider realm of the ancient Mediterranean. Religion and worship aside, a lot of the palatial elements of the Minoans and the Mycenaeans line up. It seems that the Mycenaeans likely built theirs after seeing the palaces of the Minoans. The complexes serve as a kind of cultural center run by the ruling elites in both cases. They provided things for the regular people of the land around them, facilitated group religion, traditions, everything. Just kind of unified the region around this major complex and the rich people who lived there and doled out whatever they were willing to part with in exchange for taxes, whatever forms that might have taken. It was the usual. There is an entire course worth of history in Crete, so I am being annoyingly brief. There are storerooms off the courtyards which might have been more widely accessible to a broader range of people too, like aka the poor, or at least the poorer, than the elites who lived in the luxury of the palace and the surrounding buildings. The function of those rooms might have been for storage of products, resources, and ritual tools that would have then maybe been used by these groups of people converging at the centers for festivals or whatever. And so just, you know, more widely accessible. And these storerooms, though, like there are so many just hallways lined with room after room after room filled with pots and everything. These rooms and how they were set up just really hammer home the labyrinthine nature of these palaces. Just imagine getting lost in endless hallways of storerooms and maybe there's a bowl painted on a wall like... They had to store their agricultural products and miscellaneous items somehow, and we got a labyrinth and minotaur out of it. These palaces were set up in such a way that it facilitated these group activities and operated as a kind of central hub for the whole community to gather and store the products of their work, their agricultural gains, everything. And this is emphasized by the various texts that we have found within the Minoan palatial structures at least those that we can decipher. Over time, through the later Minoan periods, the cult of worship changed after a few centuries, and then again when the Mycenaeans began interacting with them, trading and introducing things from the mainland in exchange for things from Crete to take back with them. And this is when we get the introduction of female figures with the upturned arms, like my girls, the snake goddesses. They don't always have snakes, but I do love it when they do. Unfortunately, we don't know that much about them, aside from the fact that I personally think they are very fun and cool. And they are everywhere on Crete now. It is such a joy. And similarly, unfortunately, we also don't know much about the writing systems they used on Crete before Linear B came in. See, the, the two distinctly Minoan scripts, Cretan Hieroglyphic and Linear A, are still indecipherable to us today. I've talked a little about Linear A and my personal prayers that one day it will be translated and I will know that I have something like grain storage tattooed on my fingers or, or maybe better yet, like wine storage. But until that time, I just have cute little guys on my fingers. And we're going to talk about where we found them. These, these scripts have been found on clay tablets primarily because they are more easily preserved by time, but elsewhere too. They appear on ceramics that were stored in the previously mentioned endless storerooms and just as later Linear B was used to record the commercial and economic, you know, goings about of the palace, likely this is what Linear A and Cretan hieroglyphics were doing as well. The use of these two different scripts is interesting, though, because it seems that based on the characters that there is some kind of connection between the two, even though they are distinct and they came from different parts of the island. Until, you know, at some point they began, they became unified enough to adopt Linear A more widely, and because of this, it, you know, it's hard to say which one is older. Likely they were both used at the same times, but were used by different political groups because, again, this regionality. And that is to say the island, you know, the island was not a unified society and each urban center operated individually from each other and used whichever writing system was used in the area. Which reminds us of later Greece, where, you know, it was primarily individual city-states operating separately and distinctly from each other, while there was a shared understanding that they were all Greek in some way, but they still were not unified. They were not one people 
We do know, though, that eventually the Minoans adopt Linear B for some palace records. This means that not only can we finally decipher those that survive, but we also can understand that they likely had enough interactions with the Mycenaeans and were sharing enough between their two cultures that it became practical to use a shared writing system. Because, like I mentioned on Tuesday, remember that most of what we have in Linear B is just... It's just these records, administrative stuff for the palace. We we do know some things about the gods from those records, which you will hear more about when I talk about Mycenae. But broadly, it was, I mean, I want to say boring. Obviously, it completely impacted so much about what we know about, you know, what they created, what they traded, what they stored. I just, I wish there was a story in there is all. And so just to really loop us all back, pull it all together... I want to point out that the interactions that Minoans and the Mycenaeans had, the way that they shared their culture in a very collaborative and I just want to say kind way, at least compared to what we think of now, is that it's only through that sharing of their cultures that we can even decipher any of the records on Crete because they took on this writing system that was used by the Mycenaeans. And of course, it just happens that we can decipher that and we cannot decipher Linear A. But it's a great example of how this kind of collaboration impacted everyone and everything. And as we'll see in conversations coming up too, this applies to the wider Mediterranean, where we have records from Egypt that tell us things about the people of Crete and the people of the mainland. We have records from the Hittites that tell us who was going where and doing what and what they called them, what the names for these people were in the cultures they were interacting with them. This kind of collaboration, this sharing of cultures across the Bronze Age Mediterranean is what allows us to know so much about all of them. Even now, just as back then, they were working together in this way that is just so vital to the whole of the region's success and growth and and its lasting power to the point where I can share all of this with you some well over 3,000 years later. (sighs) And so, on that note, I think I have gone on just long enough about the bull and the snake goddess-obsessed people of Bronze Age Crete. Not that we won't return to them, because remember, this whole series is leading up to the big show, the Bronze Age Collapse, all the things that came together in a kind of perfect storm that left the Mediterranean a very, very different place than it had been for so many centuries, millennia even. But of course, that is still to come. Uh, Oh, nerds, nerds, nerds. Thank you all for listening. It's always a little different when I cover such dense historical topics to try to make it fun for me and you. But gods, they're all just so interesting. So I I do hope, you know, it was uh, clear for all of you. It is such an interesting thing to navigate trying to script these things because I love them all to death, but it is just not narrative storytelling in the way that I am used to. And on Tuesday, the Mycenaeans, followed by a conversation with Dr. Kim Shelton, who's an expert on Bronze Age Mycenae. And oh my God, it was such a fun conversation. Oh, I really, I really picked her brain about the goddess worship stuff. Whew. Stay tuned. Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians, better known as the assistant producer. And in this case, honestly, I mean... 80% of the narrative episodes? That's all, Michaela. Whew! All the research. Think the earliest of Bronze Age goddesses for Michaela. Laura Smith is the production assistant and audio engineer. And hopefully by the time this airs, definitely not actually now that I say that, but next week, hopefully, Laura will have created a webpage featuring not only these Bronze Age Collapse episodes, but also some extra episodes that fill in these mythological gaps, this mythic history that comes from the Bronze Age. <laughs> 
Select music from this episode was by Luke Chaos. The podcast is part of the iHeart Podcast Network. Listen on Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron, where you'll get access to old bonus episodes and more, and hopefully new ones uh, when I am fully capable of existing as a reasonable human. Visit patreon.com slash mythbaby or click the link in this episode's description. I am Liv, and I love this stuff. Even when it's history, though I do prefer we had just a little bit more mythology to go to. Like, why didn't they leave us stories? Why didn't they leave us stories? (laughs) 